Okay, um, so we continue now with uh, what I would say the, f the most, uh, most commonly used type of neural network nowadays. Um, so we are now walking towards the backpropagation um, learning algorithm, uh, which is the algorithm everybody uses. Uh, for uh, training neural networks. Um, I mean, nowadays there are improvements of the backpropagation algorithm, but we want to understand how it basically works. And now the idea behind this algorithm is, uh, I mean, if, if it wouldn't have been invented uh, from the neural network community, I would just call it function approximation non-linear function approximation. That's what it is. Yeah? And we will see in the math lecture in the following weeks the method of least squares which is fundamental and basic in this area and also fundamental for the backpropagation algorithm. Um, yeah. But I mean there are these two different views. You can see it as a neural network you can see it as just a mathematical formula. Yeah? Um, and so what is the idea? Of course we still do supervised learning, so we are given a set of labeled training data as all the time before. So that means we do have our input patterns and the corresponding output patterns and uh, capital N of them. Yeah? Um, yes. And I mean the length of the input and the output, uh, output patterns, they don't need to be the same. Uh, so the input uh, vector has a length of n and output vector a different length. Um, yeah. And, and also our input uh, values, the, the individual values of the input and output vectors, we can assume for the following that they are uh, real values between 0 and 1. Uh, but that's not really important. We can, we can do the whole thing with arbitrary real numbers too. Okay, but what's very important now is this formula. Um, we want in the following to minimize this so-called quadratic error. What is this? Look, what, we, what do we have here? Let's start with this. This is the target, the output vector for pattern number P. Huh? So that's the output of our neural network, and what is this? So no, that's not the output. It is the target output. Yeah? One of these training pattern outputs. Yeah? And what is this? F of Q P. This is the P's input. This is the input corresponding to that output. And what is F? F is our black box. F is our black box of uh, neural network mapping input number P onto output number P. So let's draw it like that. So this is our box F and as an input we get this vector QP and as an output we get F of QP. Huh? Okay. Um, that's what we get here. And now the question is, is this f of qp equal to tp, equal to the target value? If this, the output of my neural network, always is equal, so for some of the, the training patterns, is equal to our target patterns, this is a desirable property. So we want, of course, that our neural network correctly maps all our training inputs onto the target output. Uh, so that's what we want to have. But this is not always fulfilled. So it may be that these two guys are not equal. And because they may be unequal, 
what we do is we compute the difference between these two guys and then we square it um, and that's what we have here. Uh, so this is the squared distance between the actual output and the target output. So is this clear? Because this is really fundamental for the, for the whole rest of this chapter. Uh, and now um, we don't do this for just one pattern. We take the sum over all our training patterns. And this sum, we want this sum to be as small as possible. So in the following we are looking for algorithms that minimize this sum of squared errors. Yeah? Yeah. That's what we are looking for. And there are many algorithms um, that do or try to minimize the sum of squared errors over all patterns. Yeah? Yeah. Um, yes. And also, if you look at this formula, then, or at this here, you see this is a vector and this is a vector. Uh, um, so, if we wouldn't have this square here, then the result of this sum would be a vector. And that wouldn't be nice. Because minimizing <laughs> over vector valued functions, this is a big problem. Because the question is, do we want to minimize the first component of the vector, or the second, or what, or the norm of the vector? What do we want to minimize? So in order to minimize something, we want to have one value, uh, because then we, can, we really can compare values. And, uh, but because we have the square here, the square is nothing but the scalar product of a vector with itself. And the result of the scalar product is a scalar. So this sum gives us one value, uh, just a real number. And that's why we can apply classical analysis to this sum um, and, uh, in order to find the minimum of this sum. Uh, um, yes. So now the whole thing depends on this function f. This function f um, may be an arbitrary function mapping such an input vector on an output vector. So this is, you see, this is multidimensional analysis. This function f maps a vector of length n to a vector of length m. Yeah? And what, what do we do in multidimensional analysis to find minima of functions? What did we learn in mathematics? So we compute the gradient and set it to zero. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We compute the gradient and set it equal to zero. And that's then um, a necessary condition for a minimum. Huh? But I mean in this general case there is no gradient. Why? For the, for the function here, for this function f, there is no gradient. But here there is a gradient. Why do we have a gradient of this sum, but not of our function f? Because the value of the function f is m-dimensional, it's a vector. The gradient is only defined for functions f uh, mapping from rn onto r. So the value of the function must be a scalar. 
But that's, I mean, uh, we had talked about this. This sum of squared errors gives us a scalar value, so we can compute the gradient. We can compute the gradient of the sum of squared errors and set it equal to zero and then uh, compute a solution. Yeah? yeah, so let's look at, um, yeah. Yeah, let's start with the neural networks. If we, we, we are looking at now at uh, a simplified neural network where we have n input neurons and only one output neuron. We know this from the Perceptron already. Huh? Um, and now the output value y is computed by applying some function f on the weighted sum of all the inputs. Yeah. And now we look at the sum of squared errors. This is again the same formula, it's the sum of squared errors. Huh? Um, where now, what is this? W, um, yeah, so this is now a weight vector. Look, it's only two layers and one output unit, so we have a weight vector consisting of these weights W1 through Wn. So here we have weight vector times the input vector gives us one output value. Huh? And now you see the target vector is only one value huh? because our network has only one output unit. Okay, and we compute the difference. So, um, yeah, this is now our y value is this sum, uh, which we, of course, we could write it also as w vector times the q vector. Yeah, so that's the output minus the target output. This is the difference. We square it and sum it over all patterns. The sum of squared errors, that's what we have here. Or we could write this in the summation variant. That's what we have here then. Um, yeah. And now our necessary condition for a minimum of the error function, we compute all the par partial derivatives with respect to these Wi's. Yeah? So yeah, now the partial derivative with respect to Wj um, is this. Yeah. Now, what is the partial derivative of this function with respect to Wj? Oh no, but before we compute this, why do we, why do we uh, derive it with respect to Wj? Why don't we derive it with respect to Xj or Qj or Tj? Why with respect to these weights? That's very important. Remember, we talked about finding a minimum uh, of a function mapping from the vector space Rn onto R. And finding the minimum of such a function is done by deriving the function f with, with respect to all our component variables. Normally in mathematics it's x1 through xn. But here it is w1 through wn. Why? I mean we are talking about training a neural network. Huh? And after training we want this error to be minimal. 
So what does that mean? We, want, we, want, we are looking for a training algorithm that minimizes this sum of squared errors. But what does it mean to minimize the sum of squared errors? It means after training we want to have a set of weights that minimize this sum of squared errors. So we are, what we are allowed to vary is our weights. We are trying to find a set of weights that minimize this sum of squared errors. And that's, look here, that's why we write this error function um, as a function of the weight vector. Huh? The error is a function of the weight vector and because we are looking for a weight vector we have to vary the weight vector and that's why we uh, use the derivatives with respect to the wj. Yeah? That's very important. We are looking for a weight vector that minimizes the error function. Okay, so now this is the error function. Now we take the partial derivative with respect to wj. Okay, yeah, I mean, this is a sum. Okay, uh, the derivative of a sum is easy. So we can put the derivative inside. Um, and now we have here a term squared. The, the derivative of some function squared is two times the argument. That's why we have the two here. Two times the argument times the inner derivative. Now we have to take the derivative, the partial derivative of this term with respect to wj. And now here we have a sum of these terms, wi times qip. And the partial derivatives of all these terms are zero um, apart from uh, the term with i equal j. Yeah? Now wj times qjp derived with respect to wj just gives us qip, uh, jp. That's what we have here. I mean this is our variable times a constant factor. So what remains is the constant factor. Okay, so that's the partial derivative. And now, I mean, I don't continue in the computation here because we will do this in the math lecture quite soon. That's what we call the method of least squares. A very important method in mathematics to find such parameters of um, combinations of basis functions. Uh, what you can see here already, I mean, here we have the partial derivatives. We set them all to zero. So that gives us n equations. n equations for n unknowns. The n unknowns are the wi. And you also see already that these are linear equations because all these weights, they appear linearly here. So we get a, a system of n linear equations for n unknowns. You just have to solve this system of equations. And that's what we call the method of least squares. You also can see that why does the, do these wi occur linearly here? Look, up here in our error function, they are not linear. If you would uh, really calculate this square, the product of this um, uh, term we have in the, in the parentheses with itself, then of course we would get nonlinear terms. We would get uh, squares of the wi's. But be because we take the first derivative, these two, the square vanishes here and everything is linear. Okay, yes. So now I just skip over this least squares method and uh, refer you to the math lecture. Um, and we don't continue with this. We just continue here. 
because this is the method used in neural networks. Look, we continue at this point where we have the partial derivatives. Huh? And now, we don't continue as we did it with the least squares method. We don't set these partial derivatives equal to zero. We use a different method to find such a minimum. Huh? And now, yeah, let's draw a picture here. Suppose n is equal to 2. So we are working in two-dimensional space. And that means we are looking for weight number 1 and for weight number 2. And here we draw our error function. This error function is some function depending on these two weights. It um, might look like that. So if uh, that's, um, suppose this is a contour plot. Huh? And then there may be some contours like that. Okay. And yeah, suppose this is a maximum, let's put it as a plus, and this is a minimum with a minus here. Yeah? Um, and this is a contour plot. And now we are looking for a set of weights with minimum error. So we are actually looking for this point. This is our destination point for, our, for the two weights. So the solution would be this value for W1 and this value for W2. But we don't know these values at the beginning. And now what we do is we do the so-called gradient descent. We start with some randomly chosen value for the weights. Suppose we start here with this pair of weights. And gradient descent means we compute the gradient. That's what we have here. If we have all partial derivatives and we put them all together, then that's the gradient. And the gradient is a vector pointing into the direction of steepest descent of our function. So if we start here, then the gradient would point in this direction. Um, but we are, we, we are not looking for a maximum. That's why we do not follow the gradient. But what we do is we follow the negative gradient. So we go into this direction. We just go away from this maximum. Uh, and then we are here. OK, and we need then, of course, uh, some other contour lines like this here. So then um, we may go in this direction. And then we are here. And then we need another contour line, maybe like that. So that means we go now in this direction. And then we need uh, another contour line in order to know about the gradient. And the gradient always is uh, orthogonal on the contour lines. So the gradient would point here in this direction. So we would now move in this direction. And then we would move in this direction, and so on. And as you can see, at least it looks like, we are moving towards this minimum. Yeah. So these are the two methods for minimizing such an error function. We could use the, the method of least squares, which is we compute the gradient and set it equal to zero. Or we can do this uh, gradient descent. Huh? Uh, the much better method is the least squares method. Why is least squares much better than this uh, here? I mean, least squares I showed you. you. We compute the gradient, set it equal to zero, get a system of linear equations, and we just solve it. We use 
the Gaussian elimination and solve it. And within one iteration of Gaussian elimination, we have solved the whole problem and we know the weight vector. But here, if we do the gradient descent, we start an iterative procedure um, which after some steps, but we have no idea how many steps we need, it may converge, it may not converge. Uh, so this is difficult terrain doing gradient descent. And uh, researchers are still working on better gradient descent algorithms. Um, now the question is, why don't we do the least squares method? Why don't we use the least squares all the time? Of course we use it all the time if we can apply it. But, I mean here in this example we can apply, we can apply the least squares method. We will do it in the math, math lecture. But this is only possible if our partial derivatives are linear functions. Now suppose we would have inside here, so this is the sum of the, weight, the weighted sum of the inputs. If we would use such a sigmoid function as we have seen it in, for example, when we, when did we have a sigmoid? Yeah, we introduced it at the beginning of the neural networks chapter. Then this would be a nonlinear function and then you could forget the least squares method. Yeah? Um, and that's the reason why we need uh, gradient descent. Gradient descent is what we apply all the time when we have nonlinear error functions. And then it's getting ugly. Because if in, in n-dimensional spaces we are looking for a minimum of nonlinear functions, there is no theory. There is almost no theory. For some special cases, there are algorithms with convergence proofs. But look, we have seen, so when we start here, our gradient descent leads us to this minimum. But now suppose in this two-dimensional space, there are some other minima, like this one here and this one here. and this one here, there may be infinitely many minima. Our gradient descent, depending on where, where we start, if we start here, it will lead us to this minimum. If we start here, it may lead us to this minimum. And if we start here, it leads us to this minimum. And if we start here, um, yeah, it depends. Uh, if we start here, it leads us to this minimum. If we start here, we go to this again. Um, so as soon as there are more than one global minimum, is more than one global minimum, we don't know to which minimum our gradient descent leads us. Um, and the unfortunate thing is, maybe this is really the global minimum. And these are local minima which are not good. So that local minima means maybe here the, the, the mean squared error is 0 0.01, but here it is 0 0.7, and here it is 0 0.8, and here it is 0 0.9. Uh, so that means we do have a minimum, but the error is much higher than it would be here. And uh, unfortunately, there is no proof, there is no guarantee for arbitrary nonlinear functions where this procedure leads us to. And that actually may happen with the neural network models that we uh, look at in the following. Okay, but now let's look at our gradient descent method. Okay, so we do have the gradient here. Um, and now what we do is, look, we do weight changes. So, so this vector, this vector is delta w vector. That changes our weight vector. This is the first weight vector, this is the next one. So what we do is, we compute such delta wi. And we already said 
they have to be proportional to the negative gradient. Yeah? So in each component, we just ne take the negative of the partial derivative and multiply it with some constant factor, eta. Yeah? This eta is what we call the learning rate. What does this eta do? If this eta would be very large, then we might have a vector like that. And this vector would put us to this new point, and suppose now there is a local minimum here, then we would continue moving to this local minimum. Huh? So you see if this uh, learning rate eta is too large, then this, uh, it's kind of a jump into some other region. We may even jump over big hills into, an, into the next valley. Um, so it's better to use <coughs> small learning rates, eta. It would, e even, it would actually be optimal to use a very, very tiny eta, as small as possible. But what is then the disadvantage? Yes, the number of iteration steps uh, goes to infinity uh, as, we, as we let our, our eta go to zero, then the number of iterations goes to infinity. So there is a trade-off between uh, small and large uh, etas. Okay, um, yeah, so this is, our, this, is, this is actually our formula. Huh? So we just replace the 2 in front of the sum here by minus eta. I mean, this 2 is a constant factor, so we can just omit it. And we put the minus theta, uh, minus eta in front of this sum here. Yeah. yeah, this is the gradient descent method. And I mean, it applies here if we have only a linear function in our network. If it's a nonlinear function, we just replace this. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Here you see another example of what can happen if our eta is too large. Suppose the minimum is somewhere here in this, we have kind of a valley. Yeah? This is a valley where it's going down in this direction. And now suppose we start with our weight vector here and have a large eta then it may happen that we get such oscillations from one side of the valley to the other and uh, back and forth. If we have uh, a small eta, then everything is fine and it goes down like that. Huh? And now, but now you see the problem with the small eta. Why? I mean, this is a valley and, and you're here now here it's quite steep. Huh? It's getting steeper and steeper up here, and here it's also it's quite steep, and we have a small eta. So it goes down here quite slowly. And now you're now down in the valley, and it's no longer steep. It's very flat. It goes down just a little bit. And that means our partial derivatives are extremely small here. And so if the partial derivative is extremely small, it is multiplied with a small eta, so it's getting even slower. So it, it, I mean, you can prove that it will converge down to the, the, to the bottom of the valley, but it will be extremely slow. That's the problem with these gradient descent methods. So they may be quite slow, and in practice, if you use quite complex neural networks and do gradient descent on them, it may take you days or weeks if the number of training patterns is large. Um, yeah, okay, let's go back to this formula. Look at this here. What is this? Um, yeah. So this here is the sum over i, w, i, q, i. It's this sum. Yeah? And this sum is actually the output of our network. So we can, we can, we will now 
replace this by yp. Yeah? That's the, the, the current output of the network. Yeah. Um, and then our formula simplifies a little bit and it's this what we get. Yeah? So we then would have yp minus tp but if we exchange these two then we can cancel the minus sign before the sum. Okay, so our weight changes delta wj are determined by this formula. And what do we have inside here? We have the target value for this pattern minus the, the current output of the network times um, the jth component of the input pattern. So this would be one of these components. Yeah, and that's, look, yeah, maybe we look at this picture again. Uh, here we have QJ. And this weight here is WJ. And in order to change this weight, we want to change this weight here. In order to change this weight, the delta WJ is eta times the sum over all patterns TP minus YP. That's what we, get to get, what we have here. So this is YP and then we would get an index P here. Um, and then uh, we, sometimes we draw it like that. We have the TP, um, oh no, it's the upper index P, sorry. And then we compute the difference between the target value and the current value. That's what we have here. Times QJP, here also an index P, times this input value, and that's how we determine the weight change, delta WJ. Okay, and now we can look at the, the pseudocode of the algorithm. Uh, we call it delta learning because of the delta uh, for the weights. Um, the input are the set of training examples and our parameter eta. First, we initialize all weights arbitrarily. That would mean in this picture, we just randomly select one point here. And then we go into this uh, loop. And inside here we have another for loop. And in this for loop, we compute this sum here. The sum over all patterns. Yeah? And this for loop is nothing but the sum. Yeah? So for all training examples, compute the network output, yp. Um, okay, let me see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, here in this, in this variant of the algorithm here, we are talking about, uh, or this algorithm is a little bit more general. It works even for networks where we have multiple output units. You see, our output is a vector still. Yeah? But if you replace this by the scalar, you have this, the, the variant for this simple case. Okay, so we compute the network output, which is this, um, and uh, then we use our delta rule. So the delta, uh, delta weight is the sum over all training patterns. So we use the old delta W in the beginning, it's zero, and we just add for the, the pth pattern uh, the, the delta. Yeah? And uh, so now after this loop is finished, then we do the weight change. So we add to the old weight value this delta w, and that's it. And now the critical point is here, this until weight vector converges. So, yeah, hopefully it does converge. That's the first problem. And the second problem is, 
if it converges, it may well converge to some local minimum and not to the global minimum. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and um, so this is the normal delta uh, learning algorithm. There is a variant of this learning algorithm um, where we, yeah, look here, I mean, here we have this, this inner for loop. Um, this is our inner for loop. Huh? And after this for loop ends, then I do the weight change. But we could um, do a slight change in this, oh sorry, in this program. We could just take the weight change into the for loop. Huh? And that would, me would mean after each training example, we immediately do the weight changes. Huh? Um, yeah. So both is possible. And I mean, it, it depends a little bit. If I have uh, a huge number of training examples, then we typically use this normal formulation. But if, for example, only from time to time there comes a new training example, then maybe we want to immediately do the weight change because otherwise we would have to wait for um, too long time to get weight changes. Okay, yeah, this is the incremental variant. Yeah? Um, I mean, here we, ha we do the, the weight change immediately. You see, we do it in the for loop every time after each training example. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, let's, let's compare this algorithm to the perceptron. Um, First, what is common to the perceptron is, if you look at this picture, this is actually the same structure that we have in a perceptron. Also, our output function of this output neuron is linear. So everything is the same as it was in the perceptron. But, of course, there is one difference. The perceptron is a classifier. The perceptron does a binary decision. It, as an output, the perceptron only gives a 1 or a 0, and that's it. Yeah? But here we do approximation. We may have arbitrary outputs. Yeah? Um, that's the first uh, difference. And the second difference is that the learning algorithm is different. I mean, there are some similarities in the learning algorithms too, but I don't want to look into these. Um, Yeah, okay, and, and of course, I mean, the perceptron, we have, a, we have a, a convergence guarantee for the case uh, that the two classes are linearly separable. So you see, this is really only about a two-class problem. Um, and here we do a function approximation. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, and uh, so in the function approximation case, um, if our function, output function of the neural network is linear, we could do least squares, um, but we could, of we can of course also do gradient descent. Yeah. Okay, and once we have learned such an approximation function, which gives us as an output values between 0 and 1, um, we could actually then transform this into a perceptron. So if we really want to have a binary decision, we could of course then finally apply, so if our output, we could say if uh, y p greater than theta, then uh, output output 1, else um, output zero. Huh? 
we, could, we can, of course, on top of this, apply such a, a threshold uh, function, and then we, we do have a perceptron again. But we use a different learning algorithm. OK, yeah. And now, let's look at the backpropagation algorithm. Um, the the backpropagation is nothing but a slight extension of what we did up to now. What we did up to now is we had such a, let's see, oh, we do have it here. We have a two-layer network, an input layer and an output layer, which may be just one output neuron. And the whole thing, normally is linear, normally. But let's look at, uh, at this again, yeah. This is our output. Yeah, I mean, here you see it's linear. We could, of course, apply such a sigmoid function. We could say yp is equal to f of the sum over i w i q i. And now this function may be nonlinear. You know these uh, sigmoid functions, they look like something like that. Um, x, f of x, and this of course is nonlinear. Now suppose we use such a nonlinear um, activation function f. And the question is, would this change the whole thing? I mean, first of all, it would make the derivation of these formulas um, Yeah, no, everything would work. We have TP minus YP. I mean, the YP, the output, now is a little bit different. We apply our nonlinear function, but that's no problem. We could just apply the nonlinear function. And uh, so we can use the whole algorithm. Um, but the point is that we don't need this F. It does not help us. As long as this f is such a sigmoid function, it doesn't make uh, any serious changes. Why? Um, because, because these sigmoid functions are str uh, strictly monotonic. So that means if the output of the sigmoid function uh, for some value is bigger than for some other value, then this relation holds for the inputs too. So because f is monotonic, it doesn't matter whether I apply f or I do not apply. For example, if I compute the output for some input and for another input, and then I would compare the outputs and see which one of the inputs is better, and this I could, I could uh, already have looked at the input of our function f. No? It doesn't matter. Um, and therefore, if I have such a two-layer network with only one layer of weights, um, it doesn't help us to make this function nonlinear. Using such a nonlinear sigmoid function doesn't make the network more powerful. No? It can still, if you, if you use it as a classifier, it can only separate classes which are linearly separable. It cannot do more. <coughs> so if you put the threshold function on top of such a network, it still, it, it only can separate classes which are linearly separable, like that. Huh? 
as long as you use such monotonic um, activation functions, that doesn't help us. But of course, what we want next is, we want to have, if our data maybe look like that, then we, we want to have find such a separating hyperplane which is able to separate such regions. But this does not work with two-layer networks. We need networks with more than two layers and nonlinear activation functions in the hidden layers. That's what we do next um, in the perceptron algorithm. And here you see the typical structure of a perceptron network. We have an input layer, we have one or more hidden layers, and we have an output layer. And inside uh, the, the neurons in the hidden and output layers, we do have a nonlinear activation function. Yeah. So you see, this is uh, the neuron model. It computes the weighted sum of all the inputs and then applies our um, sigmoid function, which we have here, for example. Um, yeah. That's what we do in this network. And now, for this multi-layer network, we do the same thing again. We compute in the output layer. Look, here we have the output layer, and here we have the target output, which we again compare to the actual output. Yeah? So we compute the difference between target uh, vector minus the output vector, and uh, square it, and then take the sum over all uh, patterns. Um, yeah, let's see. I mean, this is now the squared error for one for one input pattern, and uh, the sum here. This is the sum over all output units. So if I have more than one output unit, I take the sum over all output units um, of this difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and if, if for, for only one training pattern I want to make these immediate changes, then um, we use our delta rule, which is, uh, which is uh, well known already. So we take the partial derivative of this error with respect to the weights, to all the weights, w, j, i. So in order to change the weight w, j, i, I take the derivative with respect to this weight, multiply it by eta with the minus sign, and that's it. Yeah, it would be nice if it would be so easy. Um, but let's look at this picture. Why is it not so easy? Look, we do have this, um, this error here on the output units. There is one error here and so on. And we can, uh, no, uh, actually what we do is we compute the sum over all these errors. Huh? And also the sum of all patterns. So then we get one error for all these output units. And the errors on all these output units, they depend on all these weights between the second and the third layer. And I can compute the partial derivative with respect to these weights because the, uh, the, the error depends directly on all these weights. So we can use the algorithm we know already to change these weights. But the problem are these weights. Why are these weights a problem? Because the output does not directly depend on these weights. It indirectly depends on these weights. 
Now let me let me show you this. Um, yeah, let's look at this output unit. Okay? So this output x p j or yeah is equal to f of the sum over k equal 1 to um, let's call it n h like hidden layer yeah the number of units in the hidden layer w i j or is it w j i let's see yeah w j i times now times what yeah times the activations of these hidden units times x um, yeah let's say h h i okay so far so nice what we do have here is now the weights these weights in this layer and now how do we get these weights into the formula yeah we look what this is this x h x h i it's it may be for example this unit x h h i it's maybe this unit and now we do the same thing we replace this x h i by f of n h w j i times x Oh, no. times and now f of sum l equal 1 to n i like input layer and now w um, i um, l x input um, L and um, yeah we have to be careful the problem is we have a weight matrix here and another weight matrix here so um, uh, yeah okay so we have the, the index 1 here and the index 2 here and this is the index 2 again huh? You see W from layer 1 and W from layer 2. And now you see the problem. In order to change these weights, it's no problem. We compute the partial derivative of this formula with respect to these weights. But in order to change these weights, we have to compute the partial derivative of the output with respect to these weights. And now we have to apply the chain rule for uh, partial derivatives a couple of times. There is this function, then this function, then this function, and then this function. And that makes the derivation quite lengthy and a little bit uh, difficult. Huh? And I don't do this derivation here, but that's the reason why changing these weights in this layer is not so easy anymore. But people did, uh, this, uh, did this derivation and they found a formula. And that's what I give you here. Um, okay, I'm sorry again for these little translation errors. Um, 
Yeah, and that's what we, what we finally get is the so-called generalized delta rule. Uh? Um, so our, this is the delta P W J I. So that's for uh, how I change any weight W I J. And it does not depend on whether it's output layer or another layer. This is our learning rate eta times this value, uh, that's a lowercase delta, j times xi. Uh, and this lowercase delta now depends on whether it's an output, neuron, uh, output <coughs> neuron. If it's an output neuron, then we use this term. If we would omit this term, this one minus term, that would exactly be what we had before. Huh? Um, now this term is introduced, I mean there is a reason why this term is being introduced. Look, if we have only the xj and our neurons may have the values 0 and 1, then we get, um, if the, this input uh, value is 0, then we would have no weight change. If it would be 1, we would have a weight change. And that gives us an, an asymmetric behavior depending on whether the values are 0 and 1. And that's not so nice. Yeah? Um, in order to get symmetry between 0 and 1, we just multiply it with this. Because now, if uh, the input is 0, then the product is 0. And if the input is 1, the product is 0 too. So then we, have, uh, we get this symmetry. Uh, so th that's why this uh, introducing this term makes sense. But all the rest is the same as what we had with the delta rule before. Um, and now comes the, uh, the, the new uh, point in backpropagation, um, which is if J is a hidden neuron, then our weight change depends recursively, as you can see here, it, dep it recursively depends on the weight changes I made before. Look at the picture again. So what we do uh, when we train such a backpropagation network, we clamp a training pattern as an input here. Then we do the forward propagation, which is just the ordinary computation of these intermediate values. So the weighted sum of the inputs and then apply the, the uh, sigmoid function. And then again in the next step on the output units, weighted sum of the inputs uh, and apply the uh, sigmoid function, then compute the error, and once we have the error, then we go backward. That's the back propagation phase. When we have the error, then we compute these weight changes, which is still easy. That's what we do here. And what we need here is just the, the target output, the current output, and the values of the neurons in the hidden layer. We do have all these values. But now the question is if for changing these weights here. And what we need for changing these weights because it kind of backward depends on what we did here. Um, so now we have a recursive formula. So the weight change for, um, we computed these deltas um, yeah, we computed these deltas, these are the deltas for the output layer and we know them, we store them and then we use the deltas from the output layer for the hidden layer uh, and compute the deltas for the hidden layer Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, and in order to understand these indices here, um, the, so this K and uh, J and so on, 
This is explained here. Um, yeah. So what's very important, so the no notation here is WJI is the, the weight uh, going out from neuron I into neuron J. So WJI is the weight from neuron I to neuron J. That's very important. Yes. And look, so that means this WKJ here is the weight from neuron J to neuron K. So that's very important. These weights here, if I do the weight changes in the second layer, uh, unfortunately we can have only one slide here. Yeah, I draw this picture again. So here we have the output layer and then we are in the hidden layer here and it goes down to the input layer and we are now here in this uh, no we, we want to change a weight in the input layer here and this is J, yeah, W, J here. We want to change this weight. Yeah? Um, let me see, delta P, J, W, J, I. This is the weight from I to J. Oh, yeah, okay. So this is... Um, W J I. This is neuron I. This is neuron J here. And that's the weight. We want to change this weight. In order to change this weight, W J I, we need this delta J. And this delta J is what we get here. So this corresponds to this uh, neuron here. And this delta J, in order to compute this delta J, we need the value XJ, that's the value inside this neuron, XJ. We, uh, that's what we need here. And here we need the delta PK. And that's the deltas we got up here. So this is neuron K here. And here we have delta K. And this delta K is back propagated over this sum, delta P K W K J. K -J. This is W K J. Yeah, that's the picture. That's the back propagation phase. So in the output layer, we first compute these delta k's for the output layer. Then uh, we compute these delta j's for the next layer and use them then to change these wji's. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Well, yeah, maybe look into uh, the uh, algorithm scheme. So first we initialize all the weights arbitrarily, uh, randomly typically. Then we have this loop over all training examples. Um, yeah. So we feed uh, an input vector QP into the hidden into the input layer. 
Then we do the forward propagation for all layers upwards. For all neurons of each layer, we compute the activation. Uh, um, then we compute the, the squared error in the output layer. Here. Um, and then we do the back propagation for all layers. Oh, upwards. No, that, that must be downwards, of course, sorry. Is this, is this error in the book, too? Nobody has the English book, let me see. Okay, yes, so this is correct in the book. That's a translation error on the slides only, downwards. Okay, we use, we use this formula and uh, of course we, we have to here apply uh, this important formula for the deltas. Okay, and here you see the problem of this algorithm. Until W converges or time limit reached. And of course this is not nice if you reach the time limit and it did not converge. No? But that's a problem of the backpropagation algorithm. There is no convergence guarantee first. And second, if it converges, you don't know whether it's a global or a local minimum. But the good news is that quite often it works very well. It converges to, a, I don't know, maybe the global mini minimum or a quite, quite a good local minimum. Uh, I mean, it, it may, oh, we don't have the picture anymore. It may happen that it converges to a local minimum, but the, the squared error is very close to the best one, so then it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, that's about the back propagation algorithm. Um, yeah, and the, the, the very important feature is with this algorithm, uh, it's possible to learn nonlinear mappings. And what's even more interesting and nice is that we don't have to worry about the nonlinearities inside these functions. It is a generic algorithm um, and it turns out that it is able to learn quite a large class of functions. But um, we need to use a hidden layer. We need to use a hidden layer, oh I erased it again, because the, these nested applications of sigmoid functions makes it inherently nonlinear because now these nested functions, the f of the sum of the weights times f of the sum of the weights, this nested type of sigmoid functions and summations makes it inherently nonlinear and it's no longer monotonic so you really can uh, learn uh, complex nonlinear functions. Okay, ah yeah, okay, and, and what's also important is, um, so if we use it with the sum of the inputs only, here we have it again. This is the sigmoid function applied to the weighted sum of the inputs, xi. Um, then we do have a little problem because we have seen it with the perceptron. This, this sum here is a, a hypersphere in our n-dimensional space uh, which goes through the origin. But if we want to have more general hyperspheres which do have a bias, a shift away from the origin, then we have to introduce a minus theta here. Huh? 
And then we get a, we get a general hyperplane. But this, this doesn't look so nice here to, to put this minus theta in here. Or the same thing is if we use the sigmoid function of x minus a theta, then we do have a shift too. What neural network people do is, I showed you this trick with the Pelzept one. Do you remember what is the trick? How can we get the, the threshold without explicitly adding it? What did we do in the case of the Pelzeptron? We added a 1 to the vector. Yeah. We added a 1 to the inputs. Yeah? Um, because now it is then f of the sum um, i equal 1 through n. And then it's i equal 1 through n plus 1. Um, w i x i and now this last term um, is we have w uh, sorry w n x n is equal to minus theta and now if we clamp this last value xn to, uh, so if we set this equal to 1, then we get wn is equal to minus theta. Uh, so the last weight uh, corresponds to the offset. Or, I mean, this last unit, this last neuron is co typically called the bias unit, because a bias is nothing but a shift. Uh. Okay. And it's very important that the weight of this last bias uh, neuron is trained in the same way as all the other weights. The only difference is that this last input is set to 1. It's fixed, it's constant. Okay, and now let's look at a nice, a very nice application. The NetTalk uh, system. You see at this uh, um, number here, in 1986 this was uh, published by Zainowski and Rosenberg. That was right at the time where the neural network enthusiasm began. Uh, from this time on in the 1990s, a lot of money was spent for developing neural networks. And this NetTalk system was one of the reasons. I mean, that was surprisingly uh, successful. Yeah, so, yeah, a system learning to read aloud and understandable. How does, how did it work? I mean, the, the idea was, I want to have a software <coughs> that gets as an input a written text, an ASCII text, and then speaks, uh, speaks this text. And that's how the backpropagation network they used looked like. Um, so it's a three-layer backpropagation network and in the input layer we feed the text. So suppose this is a part of the text. The, the, the three words, the father is. And now, here in the center of the input layer, this is, how much was it? 29 neurons. 29 neurons to encode the whole alphabet, A through Z, and then the blank, comma, and the full stop. Huh? So we need uh, 29 neurons to encode this. So, and you see it, it's here, it's an A, so the first neuron is encoded and uh, this is an F, so neuron number four is, uh, is active, and here it was a blank, so this neuron is active, and so on. Um, and what you also see is, as an input, I mean the output, let's first talk about the output. 
the output finally should be some sound. Huh? But the network, of course, cannot output sound. It can only output bits. So behind this output of the network, there is a, another software that transforms our output bits into real sound. So there is another software and, of course, some ha hardware or a, a sound car, whatever. But what this network outputs is just some linguistic uh, intonation, so accented, uh, so this must be an accented uh, sound and it has to be deep and central, central is something about how it works in the m human mouth. Yeah? I don't know these encodings, but this uniquely determines how the output voice sound should be. Okay, so what the network learns is a mapping from the current input character onto how the sound has to be. Um, but, of course, the sound of such a character A depends on, um, on, the, um, on the environment. So it depends on what character was before and maybe even the second character before. So what they did is they used um, such an environment of one, two, three, four, five no, 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 sorry, three characters before, yeah, three characters before and three characters after, so all together seven characters, which gives an input layer of seven times 29, which is 203 input neurons. Then came 80 hidden neurons and 26 output neurons. Why 26? Because for this um, voice encoding they needed 26 neurons. Um, it's a good question, why did they use 80 hidden neurons? I have no idea. How, but the question for you is, when you have to train a backpropagation network, um, the, the software will ask you how many hidden units and then you have to give some number and this is typically done by trial and error. I mean what I would do is I would start with a very small number of hidden units like five or maybe even with only two. If it's only one that's, uh, that's too, too small. But with, with a very small number and then increase the number of hidden units as long as the error decreases um, on the test data. No? But this is an empirical process which is not very nice because suppose your neural network takes uh, two weeks for training and you do it with the first hidden layer then you try it with the second uh, so you would, it would take you uh, maybe 50 times two weeks that's quite a long time. No? But hopefully, first of all, it doesn't take two weeks, and second, you don't have to use so many trials. Okay, yeah, that's the, the net talk. Okay, the total number of weights is 18,000, which is quite a bit, because, of course, all the weights, they occur in these formulas, and they cost you some computation time. Huh? Um, and yeah, they did it at that time on a VEX 780. Um, 50 cycles for all words have been trained. And with five characters per word, that takes, and, oh, and one cycle means 1,000 iterations per word, yeah which means 250,000 iterations for the backpropagation algorithm and that took them 69 hours of computing time. Um, yeah. yeah, and it also showed really nice
properties of human learning. Yeah? Um, and I mean, yeah, this later means after enough time, which was more than 69 hours, they had a correctness in pronunciation of 95%, which is not too bad. Yeah. And so if we do have some time left, I can, I do have an audio file which I may uh, now look at. Um, yeah. <laughs> Where do we have this? Oh. Okay, yeah. Okay, why don't, why don't we hear anything? Why is there no output? Huh. Stumm. of network learning by Terry Sinovsky and Charles Rosenberg. Learning corpus taken from Carteret and Jones. Informal speech. First ray transcription. The first recording represents the first five minutes of learning with the network starting from zero weights. The second recording gives the performance of the network after 20 passes through a corpus of 500 words. The third recording shows how the network generalizes to fresh text. First recording, de novo learning. Maybe we skip a little bit. So I guess this is the second recording already. So now let's go towards the end.
I will like to sleep over at our closet every day because she lets me stay up late up at 10 o'clock or 12 every year of the I only get to stay up until 8 and I only get to stay up until 8. I get to stay up until I'll stay up on bed to 10 o'clock and be very uh -uh, sometimes I get to go to bed at 12.30. Sometimes, but most of our times I don't. On holidays. Oh, you know. Like on weekends. On holidays. No, no, I mean on holidays. I get to stay up all night. Okay, yeah, we see. So it sounds like an American kid. Yeah. Okay, so that finishes today's lecture. Thank you.